Okay, I think we can start. So good morning, everybody, and thanks for being with us today. It's the second day of our meeting, and we are getting into training, training on equipment, on purchasing, use, and maintenance. The first item in the agenda is uh, by Ms. Lezego Selete, uh, Vice Chair of, uh, of AfriLab from Botswana. Lezego, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Good morning, Lezego. So I would like morning, to <laughs> I would like to give you the floor to tell us about good practices on purchasing and operating laboratory equipment. So Thank the you. floor is yours. You will be playing the presentation from your computer. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. So let Thank me you. stop sharing. Where am I? <laughs> I think I lost the way. Lucretia, what happened? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> no, don't worry. I'll do it. Oh, share screen. I want the share screen. Let me know if you want me to play for you. Uh, it's here. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, good, good day. I have forgotten that to some is not a good morning. Good day, everybody. Uh, my name is Lesero Mogedi Salepe. Uh, I work for the Department of Agricultural Research uh, in Botswana. Today, I will be presenting to you about uh, good practices in purchasing and operating laboratory equipment. Um, and this will be um, I'll be following the guidance of this publication that can be seen on the web, as you can see on the on, on your screen. Um, and our presentation is going to flow as uh, like uh, under pre we are going to start off by trying to understand what do we mean by practice. Then we look at the good practices in purchasing, and then we go to good practices in operating the laboratory equipment. Um, the dictionary definition says the actual application or use of an idea, belief, or method as opposed to theories relating to it. That's the definition for practice. When is it now called uh, a good practice? It's a good practice when uh, it effectively and successfully produces desired, desired results. And in, when we zoom in to look at us in the laboratory, we are saying it has to be it comes to the sensitivity and efficiency of used equipment and integrity of open of, of obtained results. Uh, here we are looking at a, a goodness that is coming from well calibrated equipment, uh, equipment that has been um, set up properly. It's a bad practice when when one just uses equipment without pre-preparation. Um, how do we go about uh, preparing to purchase a piece of equipment? First, we need to carry out an audit on, what, on our needs and capacities. What does the demand for our savings tell us? What kind of personnel do we have? What's the budget like? Do we see any availing opportunity out there? And look at the facility that you have. Uh, does it allow you to have more equipment or new equipment into, into the building? And for you, before you can place an order, once you have, you have looked at your needs and the capacity that you have, 
Now you have to do research on that which you have identified and you think you want to buy. So you look at, you do your research on this specific equipment that you want to buy so that you, you find out about the new versions, the upgraded versions on that specific equipment and the price ranging. Is it still on the affordable range or is it uh, in the operation levels that you used to know if it's a piece of equipment that you had previously? Then you need to look at the suppliers in the region, in our country and in the region. And you look at the record of the support being provided around that area by the different supplies. This is to try and avoid buying a piece of equipment that you would not have support after the warranty period is over. Now you come to the procuring stage. When, before you do the procurement, now that you have done the assessment and completed uh, uh, what you need to know for you to go into procurement, now you have to form a team. You're forming a team because you don't want to be doing the procurement alone and miss the requirements of the, administra the administration unit, which is responsible for finances. So you're going to have a team that is going to do the procurement. And you look at the cost. You look at the cost and say, with that estimated cost, which I found through research, does this require for a, an invitation to tender or does it require for a, a requisition for quotation? Quotation, depending on the country, what is the limitation for quotation and what is the limitation for the invitation to tender? In some countries, you find that this, after 300,000, you have to make it an open tender for everybody to quote. And you have to bring in now you have to draw the, the specification uh, as the technical person. You have to draw the specification of that equipment. And then now you sit down with that team of the technical people from the lab and the administration people who will be doing the procurement. You sit down together. Now you draw this uh, ITT or RFQ and uh, you make sure that the ITT has the information, full details of the procuring entity. It has all the required documents. The required documents, for example, will be your, the, the, the supplier, the, the requirement for the um, tax clearance certificates, uh, trading licenses, for example, those are the uh, legal documents. And then you make sure that you state in the ITT the validity period for that that you you propose you need to have a valid period stated in the uh, in the code this will be outlining in your itt you also state the delivery delivery time four to eight weeks mostly in in some areas is four to eight weeks like in botswana we'll say four to eight weeks because we take most of our stuff from outside and we also want the supplier to state the warranty for the equipment. And you also give them the minimum. I would like you to give me an equipment with a minimum warranty, maybe of 12 months. Then you have to make sure that the ITT, in the ITT, the, uh, the specifications that you have brought in, you have prepared, now comes in as part of the ITT. And you also stand, state in the ITT what will be the training required. Sometimes you have, you, you are buying a piece of equipment that you have used earlier. You may uh, state a few days for the training that will be required, required um, for the staff. And then the bill of quantities. Sometimes we draw an ITT. You are not just buying one piece of equipment, you're buying two pieces of equipment. And under the bill of quantities, we are stating how many do I need? Uh, to purchase so that the supplier, when they quote, depending on the quantities that you want, uh, they may uh, uh, have a better way of, of pricing. Uh, you have also on the IT2 to clarify that um, how are you going to allocate your 
tender. Here you are saying if I'm ordering more than one piece of equipment, uh, then it means whoever is going to be tendering, they have to understand that it doesn't necessarily mean that I'll give them the whole order. I might give them one item and give the other item to the other uh, supplier. And then you come to stating the condition and method of payment. Here you are telling the supplier that you only pay at the end, only on the satisfactory, satisfactory delivery of the order. Uh, the next stage now will be the evaluation of the tender. Now that you have you have done the, your ITT, you have sent it out and you have received the quotations, now you have to evaluate the tender. The first stage that we'll be doing will be saying in my ITT, I have requested for um, legal pro, uh, documents. Now you're looking at the compliance, the supplier, have they complied to you the request that you had on your, your tender. Uh, have they provided the legal document? Have they complied more especially to the technical specifications of the equipment? Have they stated the delivery period? Um, uh, you need assurance of the after sales support. Have they provided the CV of the maintenance uh, person and the maintenance plan for the equipment and then what's what's the quality of the equipment like um, and the equipment costing um, now you once you have gone through all that um, let me see what fresh can I add here now that you have done all that, uh, you can go into um, you have done the evaluation, you have placed the order, now you go into receiving the order. Okay. You go into receiving the order. Um, when the order comes, before the supply, before the, they supplied, they have given you the brochures in the ITT. When they tender, they bring in the brochures. You have, you have read, you see, you have seen the requirements for the equipment. Now you you will have to prepare before you receive the equipment. You prepare, you set up the area where you are going to put your equipment, security-wise, electricity connection, network points, ventilation, all that is required for the new equipment. You make sure that it's well set and ready for the equipment to be installed. Then you have to confirm that the order came as it was on the order. Have the supplier provided everything that you requested for? and you allow the supplier to open the packages. Because here you are trying to avoid being the one opening up the packages, finding some breakdowns, and then being uh, blamed for the breakdown. So you make sure that the supplier, they open the packages, they install the equipment, and you are there so that you see that all that you ordered has been included. Um, then the other thing that you have to do, you have to be sure that your te technicians are around, whether you are the one being the technician, you have to be there. And as the installation is being done, you take notes. Here you are saying once the person, the engineer is gone, I want something, a backup, so that I can refer to and understand uh, or refresh my mind on what was uh, demonstrated and what was being we are being trained on, and you make sure that all the ones who are the technicians who are going to operate the equipment, they are there as well. The calibration, the initial installation calibration, you make sure that the supplier they ready the equipment for use. You don't want them to go away and then you try to set up and everything not working. So you make sure that they do the setup, the equipment is ready, 
for you to operate. They do the demo. In the, that part where the technicians are attending, they have to do the, what is called the commissioning of the equipment. So now they are calibrating, they are producing, they have to give you a calibration plan. Say we, we have calibrated the machine and this is the frequency at which it has to be recalibrated for good results production. And you have to make sure that you have uh, information, uh, contact details for your supplier or the manufacturer. And you have to also know about who else have the equipment in your area so that you, you get in touch, you communicate, you share information, you get advice from each other. You, whatever challenges you meet before you can even go to the supplier, you might find that somebody who is using the equipment in your area, you can sit together and, and get the problem resolved. Now that the equipment is here, we have to use it. Um, first, before we use, we have to make sure that the demo has been done, uh, the machine is set up, but I have to understand the equipment myself. So I have to go through the manual, read the manual, and I know what I'm going to be using the equipment for. I have to develop the SOP for the equipment so that everybody who uses the machine follow the SOP. This will help in uh, keeping the equipment running longer because and getting good results because we are following a consistent and standard uh, operating procedure. You, you have to have a, a monitoring tool. As we use the equipment, uh, there, there is the minor maintenance and the main major maintenance. Um, you have to make sure that you, you, you do the daily minor things in the equipment, like draining of the waste, cleaning the banners, all those small things, you make sure that uh, they, are being, they are being done. Uh, look at, look for, identify the safety measures required. Um, here we are saying, you are going to be using a piece of equipment and you are going to be using chemicals to prepare the samples that you are going to be using on the equipment. You are maybe also going to be using some gases in the equipment. So you have to read the, the, the safety uh, data sheets for this one so that you know what is required of you. Then you all, that will also help you to determine the type of protection that you will need to use. Now that you have all that information, you sit and draw the maintenance plan. How frequent is the machine going to have the minor and the major maintenance? And then you check your stock levels. Some, some labs, they have the laboratory information system where they have all the stock and everything in the system. And they have the pop-up messages that remind them on the level for refills. But whenever you are using cards, you have to make sure that you go through your cards and check that your stock levels will, uh, will not uh, stop the operations. If they have gone to refill levels, make sure that uh, you do the refilling. Now you are going to operate the machine. Um, PPE is critical have to make sure that you are using the correct PPE, PPE and you have to be sure that immediately after installation and the demonstration or the training, you use the machine to avoid forgetting some operation. Even if it were not only one person attending the demo, you might find that the whole team has forgotten about a few things. And maybe you are not even uh, you try to read the manual, you missed now it, you, it, it's going to be it's going to cost you because you will have to recall the supplier or the engineer to come and redo the demonstration. So practicing well in time to make sure that you understand the equipment and use it immediately will help all in, in, in and cost it will help you work cost effectively. After use, um, we have to make sure that uh, we record what we have observed 
during the operation. Is the machine calling for, operation, for, for, for maintenance? Is there any deterioration? Sometimes if your plan says every three months I'll do the maintenance, you might find that the workload says otherwise. We have overloaded the equipment, now it requires a maintenance earlier than the time because you are seeing that from the record on the equipment performance tool. Dispose of the waste if there has any, there's any waste uh, that has to be disposed of and ensure that you dispose as recommended in the um, dispo, uh, in the risk assessment recommendations. When we are looking at the uh, safety data sheets, they give us recommendation on how to dispose of waste. So we have to be sure that we dispose of waste as per recommendation. Tidy up the area. And if the type of equipment that we are using need to be covered for, to avoid dust and all that, make sure that you cover the equipment. Once you have completed that, you take your stock level. You, you go back to, you have checked your stock. Now you have to do the orders well in time to ensure that the delivery comes before you, you are stopped from doing your job. Um, I think um, our slides come to an end here. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lucretia. Thank you very much to you, Lezego. It was uh, very, very interesting, I think. So I would like yeah. to ask uh, participants if they have uh, any question, either yes, by please. raising their hand or by writing them in the chat. Let me see. Mm. Is there any it question is. for Lezego? If not, I don't see any hands up. So I would like to thank you very much, Lezego. And we now pass to the next item in the agenda that is actually by me. And uh, it's about procurement of uh, laboratory equipment. All of you, uh, let me quickly just uh, uh, switch the screen. Um, oh. Okay. So all of you answered a questionnaire on procurement, or at least the majority of you, we received 56 replies. So I integrated your answers. Um, just give me a second and move all of this. <clears throat> Uh, I integrated your answer in uh, my presentation on how actually to do a, a procurement or what would be a right uh, uh, procedure to do it at least according to FAO. Okay, so let me play it. Um, so indeed, many thanks to all of you that replied the survey. We received 56 answers in total. We will now see some of the replies you provided at the very beginning of this uh, uh, training session. But then I integrated some of your answers, or actually the outcomes of uh, the survey, in uh, the next slides, really, on the training. So the first question we asked you if, is uh, if uh, uh, your laboratory is directly responsible for procuring the equipment and consumables it needs. The majority of respondents said yes. So 73% of them said yes. Then how do you procure the equipment and consumable you need? Uh, again, the majority said that they don't do it uh, directly. So they're not directly responsible for it, but they send a list of what they need to another office and then they procure the equipment. Still, we have a majority that said like by other means. Do you have a transparent and well-organized procurement procedure? For example, a written document reporting how the items to procure should be identified, the technical specifications are, should be prepared, the bid is launched and the offers are evaluated. 63% of respondents said yes, but still we have, uh, sorry, said yes. Uh, still we have 24.4% uh, that, yes, that said yes, but it's not complete. 
So in this sense, uh, the way some steps are implemented is a bit blurry. And then uh, there is a uh, 12% that still I think it's quite uh, significant that said no. They don't have a transparent and well-organized procurement procedure. When do you do the procurement? Well, the majority of laboratories said when, when I need it, when I need to improve the analytical capacity of my laboratory. And uh, still 17% of respondents said when I have budget to do it. All these, all like a better analysis of the answers provided will be in the report of the meeting. Let me tell you, let me tell you a bit about, uh, um, am I still connected? Sorry. Yes. Uh, tell you a bit about the procurement in Glossolan because yesterday during her presentation, Notman said that uh, we provided equipment to 21 laboratories uh, that participated to the Glossolan PT 2019. And you can see them here in the map. You see, like we try to have a geographical balance so that all regions uh, were served. So what did we do? Well, first of all, we looked at laboratories that participated to the Glossal PT 2019 only. So only those that participated in the PT could compete for equipment. We gave the possibility to uh, compete for equipment to all laboratories that showed a good proficiency in soil analysis and that could compete for receiving financial support uh, from FAO. As you know, FAO cannot provide budget uh, or any other type of support to developed countries. So only countries uh, that are classified as developing countries could apply for, uh, the, um, for, for, could compete for these resources. And there is also some exception for those countries in transition from a state to the other. Here you see an example of how we uh, selected these labs based on their PT results. You see, in this case, all parameters were fine, but uh, one, for one soil type. In this case, we accepted the country, the laboratory, for, uh, the, for the competition on equipment. And then we also had excellence cases like this one, in which all, um, well, the results of the PT were so good that we had no outliers. What we did not accept, so that those that could not compete for uh, the equipment uh, were laboratories that had this type of results. So either they analyze very, very few parameters uh, or they still <laughs> analyze parameters, but they obtain, um, I don't want to say bad results, but like uh, uh, results that did not meet our standards. Then all laboratories that qualify to receive the equipment were asked to complete an equipment purchasing assessment like this. So in which we focus on the identification of needs. Indeed, in this form, we inquired about the status of laboratory facilities, the type of analysis performed in the lab, the equipment the lab would need the most in relation to the type of analysis to use it for, uh, the ability of the lab to operate and well maintain the equipment we will eventually provide them with. And ultimately, the ability of the lab to organize and host training for other laboratories in the country if Glossolan strengthens their capacity. So, the final decision on the laboratories to support was made based on their answers, on the answers of these labs to this assessment. And only laboratories that send us back the assessment could compete for equipment. Indeed, what happened is that sometimes we contacted laboratories, uh, making them the offer, so telling them, look, you, you, you can compete for equipment, and they didn't reply to us. So in that case, this laboratory, um, well, we, we did not work with them anymore. We did not consider them for the procurement. Just a note, and uh, here I also have to, well, apologize, but this in a few slides. Laboratories that did not qualify for receiving equipment were asked to complete another type of assessment, aiming to identify the areas for improvement. And these, uh, these assessment here you see on the screen. So we, we aim to identify what went wrong 
from the reception of the samples to the sample preparation, sample analysis, calibration, quality control and data reporting. And we also asked the lab for an opinion. So we asked them, what do you think it went wrong? And what actions did you took, did you take to improve the performance, your performance after receiving the results of, uh, of your PT, no? after the, the results of the statistical analysis? So in this regard, I have to apologize to this other group of laboratories, because unfortunately the workload was such that we couldn't um, establish any forums for this discussion and support. We will try to establish this type of forums as soon as possible. So please accept my apologies if we did not follow up to your answers to this uh, to this assessment. So at this point, uh, what uh, we did? Well, the Glossolan Chair, Vice Chair, and myself as FAO, identify the type of support to provide to each laboratory that send us back the assessment. Priority was given to equipment need, needed for chemical and fertilizer analysis, and still we did our best to provide labs with equipment they can operate and maintain. But not only, we also looked at creating a balance so that we don't give, for example, $50,000 equipment to one lab and $1,000 equipment to another. We looked for a balance in the investments we were making on each laboratory. Uh, thereafter, laboratories were informed on the decision of Glossolan, so what type of equipment we can provide them with, and they were asked to send us technical specifications. So in this regard, we gave them some freedom. We told them, okay, please write the technical specification for this type of equipment that we can purchase for you. But they were free to write the technical specifications as uh, um, they wanted. So we also assessed a bit their capacity in writing technical specifications. And I want to give you an example of what we got back. We had a case, for example, in which uh, two different countries, so two different laboratories, because we are purchasing equipment for one laboratory per country, uh, well, we basically get the same equipment, but the way they wrote the technical specifications is completely different. So these are the technical specifications provided by the first laboratory. You see very short, there are no quality control um, criteria, basically, they're, they're ba very basic. And these are the technical specifications for <laughs> the second laboratory that uh, is applying for the same equipment. So what did we notice? This is just an example, but that well reflected what we received back. And that's also why we are a bit late on the procurement, because we had, actually I had to go back several times to, to the laboratories to ask them, to improve their technical specifications and comply with all FAO standards. So in general, we notice that the majority of laboratories know what they want, but they do not know how to ask for it. So they, they are not able to well formulate your, their request. Still, technical specifications are rather vague and incomplete, and they, they do not want to put as quality control criteria. Here I took a definition of what is a quality control criteria from internet. Basically, it's whatever it takes to satisfy a customer. So the characteristic of a good or service that determine whether it meets the express and implied requirement of its customers. Basically, <laughs> that's needed to assess whether what the offer you are receiving is in line with what you want. So the quality control criteria are super important to assess the offers received through a bid. So let's get a bit into the details. What should be included in the technical specifications? Well, there are some elements that are key to write uh, the technical specifications. These are, these are the characteristic of the equipment you want. And as long as you don't approach a vendor directly, so I don't know, you go to that specific manufacturer and say, I want this uh, equipment, uh, this model of your equipment, you should not specify any brand, okay? Because you should leave it open to vendors to make the offer. Then you need to specify uh, the unit of measure. Well, in the case of equipment, usually um, it's a each because you, you talk about pieces of equipment. Again, if, you if we talk about reagents, you might specify maybe liters 
and put like uh, three liters or whatever you need per each item that you have in the technical specifications. You may include warranty and after sales services requirements. If needed, you may indicate uh, the requested user manual language. Depending on the equipment, you may want to indicate the type of software required, if any accessories are needed, and whether you have any compatibility requirements. For example, if you have technical specifications with multiple items, you might say item one should be compatible with item three, so that what you get is actually something you can operate at the best. If required, you may want to add detailed packaging requirements, and you also may include the installation and training request. Like, okay, I need uh, the manufacturer, the vendor, to install the equipment for me, and I need also to be trained on its use and then receive the after, after sales services, or I just need of the installation and then I deal with it myself because I already know the equipment. Examples of quality control criteria. Uh, these are taken from uh, the technical specifications provided uh, by, by the laboratories that are competing for that competed for equipment last year. For example, they talk about correlation coefficients, uh, certifications, different types of certifications. Well, <laughs> the most uh, used uh, um, quality control criteria is that uh, uh, basically the vendor should comply with the specifications. And, uh, and then also we talk about uh, calibration certificate. For example, 1,600 Celsius degrees at 20 um, ampere. So you see, like you, you can write basically anything. You, you need to assess the, the quality of, of the, the offer. Usually another document to prepare is the delivery plan. In this document, you can resume your request, so you can organize. Uh, basically, it's um, an extract from the technical specifications in, in which you specify the item and the quantity of each item per lot. It depends on how many lots you have. In this case, we had, for example, 21 lots, one lot per country and laboratory. Then you have to specify the destination of the lot. So you have to put the name of the laboratory, the address of the laboratory and the country, and specify the maximum period of time accepted for the delivery of equipment. For example, four weeks after that the vendor is informed that uh, uh, he actually or they actually won the bid. You have to pay attention in this case because you have it's not only up to the vendor to send you the equipment. It's like it's not, a, it does not only depend on them, it also depends on custom procedures. So you should consider the time needed to prepare the documents for the customs and apply for the permit to import actually the equipment in this, in this, uh, in this regard. Once you have the technical specification ready, all documents ready, you have to place uh, the order, okay? We have, in general, we have three options. The first option is the easiest one. If uh, the, um, the internal procedure of your institutes allow for it, and is that basically you already know what to buy and from who. So you just uh, go to the manufacturer and say, I want two pieces of this specific model of equipment. Uh, the second option is that you launch a closed bid. Closed bid means that you already know what manufacturers or what vendors to approach because you trust them. You know that they will not give you bad equipment. So you invite them only to participate in the bid. So this is, this is usually done to ensure the good quality of the offer received so that the evaluation of the offers is easier. For example, you can evaluate the offers only based on the cheapest price. The third option is to have an open bid. So everybody can participate in it. But in, if you go for this option, you have to pay attention and you have to have an extremely well-prepared procurement with uh, all criteria to assess the offers well-defined because you take the risk to purchase crap, honestly speaking. So 
whatever this uh, um, this option uh, gives you the opportunity to receive more offers and eventually to get a better deal okay but you need to be well prepared so going back to the uh, results of uh, the survey you answered to uh, this is what the majority of respondents are doing so we asked them how does your procurement work and 36 uh, percent of respondents said that they contact the, the vendor they trust in uh, directly so it, it, this is option one the easiest one uh, again 36 percent say that uh, um, they do an open bid so case three any vendor can participate in the bid and the rest, it's a bit of a mix. But so how to evaluate the offer? Again, going looking at the results of the survey, on what basis do you decide what vendor to rely on? The majority of respondents said that they look for a compromise between the price and the quality of the equipment or the consumables. And still we have a majority, like a, a good piece of the cake, so 20, almost 25%, they say that they go for the best quality equipment consumables. And the rest say, I go for the cheaper offers or some consumables have been traditionally purchased from cer certain vendors. So I go uh, to them for, for such. Do you have any evaluation criteria to evaluate the offers you receive from vendors? For example, if the vendors offer any warranty training and in-person or remote support, the majority, 85% said yes, which is very good. <laughs> Here I reported some of the evaluation criteria you mentioned. You reported in the survey, for example, they check with vendor where the equipment has been supplied before, and guarantee the availability of the product at time, reliability of the acquisition process, quality of the technical support of the vendor. Um, there needs to be a good technical back uh, stopping, the payment on, on delivery. You, you need, when you place, a, uh, when you open a bid, you need to know uh, the terms of the payments, what is acceptable for you, and also to make sure that you don't get cheated so that eventually you pay before and you get no, get nothing back or you get it in three years. Uh, dependability of the vendor. And again, the main criteria is the technical specification and then the price. So quality first, and then we look at the price. Uh, warranty, training and in-person remote support, compliance uh, uh, to supply of required documents, technical specification and cost evaluations the reliability of the manufacturers and the vendors, credibility that you need to trust the supplier, availability of certificate of analysis, price, cost of the analysis, warranty period. You see, it's all a long list that you provided and it's all really true. Let's try to organize a bit of this information. So offers in general can be assessed in two ways. Either you go for the cheaper offer, the cheapest offer, or you go for the cheapest offer, the better meets your request. So in terms of preparing the bid, these two points are very different. In the first uh, case, so you, if you go for the cheapest op offer, you simply assess the offer against the price. In the second case, yes, you assess the offer uh, also, uh, you assess the offer against mandatory requirements and evaluation criteria. So quality first, the price comes later. And you can still go for the cheapest one, but that meets your, your quality criteria. Okay. Examples of mandatory requirements. So you need to know who you are buying from. The vendor should be eligible. For example, should be a legally registered entity, should not be suspended, uh, debarred, nor otherwise identify as ineligible. There should not be any conflict of interest and does not declare bankruptcy. Then the vendor should be qualified. 
for example, should prove they did not have a contractor default. So basically they did not perform off a contract for at least, and you define how many years. So you should, the vendor should prove that they deliver or actually comply with all con uh, contracts they sign in the last, for example, three years. Uh, still, the vendor should prove to have at least, again, you define how many years of experience and at least you define how many years of experience in the procurement of similar offers. You should look at the complexity of your bid. For example, for the procurement of Glossolan equipment, we will uh, procure equipment to 21 countries. 21 laboratories, this bid is extremely complicated. We have to make sure that whoever win the bid is able to comply and provide us the equipment, okay? And then must demonstrate the soundness of its financial standing. This is the first step to assess an offer. If a vendor does not comply with your mandatory requirements, you should exclude it from the bid. Okay, as a general rule. Examples of evaluation criteria, so make sure to buy what most aligns to your expectations. Uh, this, still, this is still an example related to the third case. Um, well, actually to this case here, if you go to the, cheap, um, to the cheaper offer that better meets your request, but also if we look at uh, an open bid, Okay, so in which everybody can compete. So these are examples of, of evaluation criteria. You, you, you have technical and financial evaluation criteria. So the rated technical uh, criteria, uh, with the, you can assign the total weight you want. For example, 30 or 20% of the total. Okay, this is how much uh, the technical components will wait um, in the final assessment of the offers. And then you assess criteria, for example, installation. Installation required in the technical specification, uh, but not provided by the bidder. This, in, and to this you would assign a point. For example, in this case, it's zero. Or the installation is required in the technical specifications, and it's provided by the, bid, the bidder, 10 points. And ultimately you have the rating. Uh, the best would be that you get to 100, so it's easier to make the calculations, but uh, if you are below 100, you should make, uh, you should in this case make a calculation to ensure that then there is a correspondent with the total weight. And then the second component, so we saw the technical criteria. You can also have financial criteria. Again, you should get to 100, which means that if you gave 20%, you, you rate it, you gave a total weight of 20% to the technical um, um, criteria, then you will have 80% in the financial criteria. Or as we did, as we are showing in the example, if you are 30% in the technical, then you, you have 70% in the financial criteria. Oh, sorry, I thought there was an animation. Uh, again, we talk about criteria. So for example, you can give 100 points to the lowest financial offer, but you'd also, you should also uh, think about how you want to define how many points to assign to the other offers that are not the cheapest one. Okay, and again, you have the rating or weighting. At this point, you should know what offer to accept. So you should inform all vendors, either they won or uh, lost the, 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 the bid, and then start preparing the documents with the vendor that you will rely on. So the ones that win the bid. So this was the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and found it useful. Is there any question? Yeah, there are some questions from uh, Portugal, Ala Levans. I uh, was wondering about the percentage of private and public clubs which can be involved in the, in the procurement. I mean, is there any correlation between size and the way procurement is made? 
and the type of uh, laboratory means private to public. Okay, so uh, you can read it in the chat anyway. Yes, I'm reading it starting at eleven thirty-two. Right, that's the first question. Yes. Okay, so I would like to know um, of the labs who responded. Uh, what is the percentage of public labs and uh, uh, who answered, and uh, the percentage of private labs uh, who answered? Uh, I actually don't know. We should check. We can report this information in uh, in the report. And do you have any breakdown on the size of the laboratories? For example, I oh, know this we don't have. Is there a correlation between size and the way procurement is made? Uh, we don't have this information. We, we can uh, extrapolate from other, well, we can cross-check data from also other surveys that uh, we, we launched, but uh, at the moment, I, I don't know. I don't have this information. Then again, do you do any follow-up after the equipment has been purchased? For example, after two years, will you go and see if the equipment was used in the way it should have been and was not left uh, gathering dust in the corner after one year? Yeah, this refers to monitoring. And uh, we are thinking about a monitoring uh, system for the equipment we are purchasing. Well, already through the assessment, we aim to ensure that we don't get uh, uh, to equipment to any laboratory that they cannot operate or that they don't use really because we also ask about the number of samples that they analyze each year so what type of analysis you do and uh, uh, how many samples you you analyze with these analyses uh, every year so for example if you ask me for an equipment to do i don't know um nitrogen analysis but then it ends up that you you analyze for the you do this type of analysis on 50 or 100 samples per year i would not make the investment the investment should should be justified um is there any other question Yes, it just is important to, I think the, the first question from, uh, from Alan was also regarding like if the size of the lab uh, is taken into account uh, for the eligibility of the, of the lab. I think no, that's the, only, the only main factor is the PT results. Yeah, well, uh, PT results, as I said, like, let me go back to... So we just to stress the attention on this point. So everybody know, like, just so people know, if they, even if they have a small lab, if they can... Uh, uh, attend the procurement or not. Let me do this. Give me a second. Huh? I want to show you something. So basically, this is the assessment we ask uh, laboratories to complete the ones that uh, have good results in PT, okay, in the proficiency test. So we ask them, well, first to tell us who they are, so general information. Then the laboratory facilities. Um, in, in the case of Glossolan, because we are supporting so many laboratories at the same time, so for example, this year it's 21, we could not really help with uh, uh, facilities. In order for FAO to help, uh, with, uh, with the building, so with the facilities, it requires a different procedure that it's quite uh, complicated and require working a lot with the local offices. And this was too complicated to follow up for the large number of labs we were intended to support. So we didn't look at uh, supporting labs in terms of improving laboratory facilities this year. Then if you go to the part on the analysis, you see that we are asking, can you tell us the type of analysis uh, that you conduct in your laboratory and the average number of soil samples you annually analyzed? For, so for example, here, they cross that they do chemical analysis. Here they write that they do um, OC by Walkley and Black, for example, and that for these analyses, they do 2,000 analyses per year. 
this is of great value for us. If this would be 20 or 200, it's already a bit low, but we cannot really, well, of course, uh, maybe 200 for an extremely small lab with maybe one or two technicians, it, it's a lot. So there is an influence also in this. We try to make a um, consistent analysis, no? in the type of laboratory and, and its capacities compared to the request they are making. So yeah, the size of the lab influences a bit our decisions, but we take it into consideration. For example, there are maybe uh, small labs in a country only that still serve the whole country. So how can we exclude them or penalize them for this? Maybe they are the only lab doing the, the analysis in the country. Then we ask them for the equipment. So again, here we have information on the analysis. And here uh, they ask us, let's, let's put here maybe, okay, let's keep it 200. Let's say that is uh, a small lab, okay? But uh, serving um, the whole country or large part of the country. We have all this information. We have a big database in which we register all the information we are collecting through the surveys that we are sending around so that we don't have to ask you to, to tell us again the same information over and over again. Uh, so, and here you would tell me, okay, I need of equipment to do wall clean black. Okay, great, it's justified. So we will help you with this. Uh, well, here you should specify the type of equipment actually, which I am not able to do. And then uh, here we ask them if uh, um, if Glossolan provides you with the new equipment, will your laboratory be able to find its ongoing operation and maintenance? So you can say yes for any type of equipment, or it will be difficult but possible. It depends on the type of equipment because in most of the cases, uh, lab sent us a long list of equipment, and then we had to pick the pieces doing all this analysis that I just told you about. So in case we, we usually try to go for equipment that they are able to operate and maintain. Uh, but if it's uh, difficult, uh, we will really strengthen this point in the technical specification. So for example, we will ask the vendor to provide regular training, to do the installations and offer remote support. And also we put a lot of after sales services. And then one thing that is very important for us is that uh, Glossolan, you know, is not aimed to help, uh, um, let's say, any specific labs. We will help all labs, but the initiative is aiming to, to have a, a national, regional and global impact. So we need to make sure also that the laboratory we are helping is able to downscale activities and to support other labs to become eventually like a, a national hub, no? A national hub for training and, and support laboratories in need. So this is very important for us. And in case we can, we can help the winner of the, well, I don't wanna say the winner of the competition for equipment this year, uh, but these laboratories, actually are national reference laboratories. Most of them are national reference laboratories. So they already have a role in downscaling uh, and implementing Glossolan uh, activities. So they are supposed to say yes to these or yes, but we have problem to do it. And then we will have them uh, really playing their role also through the establishment of the national soil laboratory networks. I hope this um, answered the question. Is there any other question? If not, we are a bit uh, um, ahead on the program. So I would like to ask uh, um, our trainers on uh, equipment installation use and maintenance. So I ask Leonardo in this case, if uh, you would like to start your training now, or if you would like to postpone it to after lunch or eventually to extend it. So you have one hour more to give the training.
Leonardo? Let me see. I see you. I see you as one of the participants, but uh, we cannot hear you. Leonardo? Or any other colleagues from uh, Buki? Okay, so we do this training uh, this afternoon. Yeah, there is, I cannot find anyone more, any, anyone from Buki except for Leonardo. Yeah. Hello? Oh, ah, sorry? Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, I, I was away for uh, for 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 a uh, little bit. Yeah. No, don't worry. So we are a bit uh, um, ahead with the um, with agenda, meaning that uh, we are fin uh -huh. we finish the morning session now. I would like to uh -huh. ask you if uh, you would like to extend your training by one hour, so maybe start now and then run it for three hours, or if you would like to have it only this afternoon. Or you could just no, like no. start and we finish earlier this afternoon. <laughs> no, I think that uh, we have planned already for a two hours training maximum. Um, well, I think that it will be better. I mean, for us, it will be more convenient if we stick to the to the, to the plan schedule. But if it is if if it is uh, definitely required that we start now, then we, we can also do that. But uh, from our side, I, I think that we would prefer to 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 stick to the two um, two p.m. schedule. Is that okay? Okay, for me it's okay. <laughs> okay, um, great. So let me ask any of the participants if uh, they they would like to add something to the part on procurement or if they would like to make a statement on their experience in terms of procurement. There is also a question from Josef in the chat, in from the audience. This in their part... I don't understand this question. Joseph, can you please reformulate? You mean like if they have a role in um, helping us with the procurement or I don't know. Yeah, um, I'm talking of uh, like in assistance with training and even with procurement because some of them have uh, uh, some easy access to procurement and facilities for training. Mm -hmm. Well, you can definitely help uh, in the case of uh, um, ICRAF. Well, they are based in Kenya. They are not the national reference laboratory, but they can work with the national reference laboratory, definitely. At the end, we, we aim to push for cooperation so that all labs based in the same country can help each other. And uh, so who, who can offer training, it's welcome to offer training. Also assistance in uh, writing the technical specification. I think there is a great need for experienced institutions on these to train and help uh, laboratories in needs. So yes, you, I, my suggestion is that um, you would better define uh, uh, your role at the national level with uh, your national reference laboratory, but also with your national cell laboratory network that we're establishing now. At the regional level, because we are talking about uh, what you mentioned are big organizations that have a, a, a role in the region, uh, I can help you with that. We, we, if you are available to offer support to countries and to other countries and laboratories in the region, we can talk and I think they would welcome your support very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to you that to are offering support. Spella, you had uh, your hands yeah. up. Spella. Yes, uh, I would like to thank you, Lucrezia, for your hard work when looking at these data. Uh, indeed, the procurement of equipment, <clears throat> sorry, is a very complicated procedure, at least uh, in Slovenia. So if I'm talking for our institute, we usually hire the, some other uh, firm to, to, to do all the procedures that are needed. I would like to say that it's also very important that you do some um, market search before you prepare this technical specification so that you really know what you need. We had in the 
yeah, five years ago, we were buying a new Kildal equipment. And at the end, we knew there were only two possible vendors to offer it. And there was at the end only one uh, who was uh, suitable because otherwise we would have to change all the Keldal uh, tubes, which we all know that are very mm -hmm. expensive. But at the end, it turned out that this vendor um, changed uh, the site of production to China and we had four mm -hmm. years problems with the equipment. At the end, we got 50% uh, scout but it was still a problem one of the problems is also service engineers you have to have service engineer in your country and available and the trained one because if you don't have it you your equipment is not working for two three weeks one month and it can be also very expensive if you have to hire service engineer from abroad so then, Thank you very much for sharing your, your experience, uh, Stella. Indeed, the doing a market research beforehand, it, it's, uh, it's pivotal to this type of work. And I think this was also mentioned in the presentation of, uh, of Lesego. And again, I would like to show you once more. This is our website. You have uh, a, a, in the drop down menu here on the side, you have uh, a voice on equipment. And in here, you can download these good practices that were prepared uh, by the leaders in all regions. So by the chairs, uh, mostly, and the experts on these in, from all regions. You have it available in all these languages. So please consult it, because in here, you really have like a distinctions of good practice and bad practice in case of uh, well, acting bef well to do before purchasing or accepting a donation, because this is r very relevant also if you accept a donation, then to place your order or request for donations, and then what to do when you receive your purchase or donation. You can consult this document. Everything is available online for free. Uh, another thing that I would like to inform you about that I forgot in the presentation is that currently I'm working with the procurement unit at FAO to well to do the procurement because it's uh, really time consuming. We still have to launch the bid, so to open the bid because the preparation of the document is uh, well it's very it's very tough and intense. And also in this regard, I would like to remind you this applies to all Glossolan activities because sometimes we are late. But we are late also because maybe we received late submissions from countries. So every time a country is late in sending us an input or sending us information in this case for the equipment or, or they are sending us incomplete information and I have to get back to them. This is not delaying uh, the work only for that country, but is delaying the whole work. So please be timely in. Um, in providing inputs also because remember Glossolan is uh, works on a volunteering base we have volunteers we have working groups and leaders that are working for us for free and uh, it happened many times unfortunately that uh, the experts the working group or ourselves still do start to do a work and then uh, once we are done we receive like 20 inputs more and we have to redo it again <laughs> So it's a bit annoying, but it's especially time consuming. I mean, like for our staff as Glossolan team, uh, meaning like me and Filippo, okay, we can bear with it. But uh, when we look at the contribution that experts give us on a voluntary basis, like, I don't know, like I, I look at you, Spella, because you are just on my screen. <laughs> you know, you are the vice chair of, uh, of Eurozolan and you are also working a lot in uh, in the working groups for the development of the SOPs. So she also has her work beside the one she's doing for Glossolan. And, you know, I feel embarrassed when I ask her, like, please, can you redo this? Because we receive like five inputs more. <laughs> so please remember this. I was telling you, I'm working with the procurement unit at FAO to write a short booklet on procurement, like guidelines on procurement, a bit more specific that, that include all the things I mentioned 
in my presentations and that would accompany this other document that I'm showing you on screen. Okay, um, is there anyone else that uh, would like to, Joseph, yes. Joseph? Yeah, yeah. hello. Uh, just one quick addition, something that we found very helpful, uh, especially with uh, many of the national labs that use uh, laboratory equipment far beyond the expected lifespan of the equipment, is to make sure that in the course of procurement, they identify some of the weak links with the equipment, the most mm -hmm. likely parts that can be damaged in the equipment in the course of the lifespan of this equipment and try to make some purchases well ahead of time of such spares. Uh, because by the time they may need those spares, they may have changed the model of equipment and the type of spares that are needed for the particular brand that they have may be out of stock. This has helped some of the uh, national labs to be able to prolong the life of some of their uh, equipment. And uh, it should be something to be taken into consideration when they are procuring the equipment right from the very start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else that would like to add to the um, discussion? The last question from Alan. They're asking about the, war the, the warranty. Um, yeah. Are there any rules concerning the insurance of equipment after the warranty period ends? Well, uh, what we are asking in um, in our um, procurement for some types of equipment, so the one that is most valuable, it's a kind of extension of the warranty for usually a couple of years. Not all uh, um, vendors offer this, but, uh, but we, we try to get it. But I would say that there is uh, not any rules. I can ask the procurement unit better for this information. Um, again, a remark from Spela, spare parts are really important. It is a good practice to buy them before the vendor cannot guarantee them anymore. Yeah, this, I think this is very um, valuable, a valuable remark, because it can be that the, the piece, like the, one of the spare parts of your equipment breaks after, well, maybe after quite some years, and maybe that equipment is not in production anymore. Right, Spella, this is also what you are referring to. So in that case, you have eventually to trash the wall equipment <laughs> to, to replace it all. Okay, anyone else? If not, we end the morning session here a bit uh, before the foreseen time. And we see you again at two. So in uh, one hour, 45 minutes, long lunch today. Okay. So thank you very much, Spela, eh, um, Lesego, for your presentation, and Spela and uh, Joseph and uh, all other uh, other participants that shared their experience and uh, asked questions and, and commented to the presentations. So thank you so much. We see you again at uh, 2 p.m. Have a good lunch. <laughs>